Fasting and spiritual disciplines are something that we can oftentimes think are simply for our own spiritual benefit or for our maturity or for a tool to help us to grow closer to Christ. And those things are definitely true. Those things help bring us closer to Christ. But there's something beyond that that I think oftentimes we miss. When it comes to this idea of fasting, when it comes to this idea of us pursuing God in disciplined ways and doing things that are drawing us closer to God, it's not just for us, but it should be for those around us as well. That's why at Word of Grace we say we love God, we love people, and we serve the world. So today we're going to kick things off by going to Isaiah chapter 58. So if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and start finding your way over there to Isaiah. And I want to set the stage for you a little bit so that way we can understand what was going on that made this prophecy that Isaiah gave to the people of Israel necessary. So in Isaiah 58, the setting for this text is God's response to the nation of Israel repenting in action but not in heart. The people were doing all of the right things because terrible calamity had come up on them, and God was telling them, if you do these things, then I'm going to turn away uh, from allowing you to go through all of this great difficulty. So the people did what God said because they were tired of dealing with all of the oppression and all of the difficulty that they were experiencing. So they did what God said, but they just went through the list and kind of checked off each piece of that list, but their heart was not really in it. And you can tell this because of God's response. And I think oftentimes we do the same thing. We can go through the motions of doing the things that we think are in compliance with what God wants us to do, but God's not looking for compliance. He's after the heart. If you'll remember last week, we talked in Joel chapter 2, this idea about not just rending your garments, but rending your heart. So when we are in that true state of repentance, it's not just about saying all of the right things or doing all of the right things, but instead it truly is about the heart. And if the heart is engaged, certain things are going to happen that are going to be a testimony to the heart being engaged. And often we get these things mixed up because we think the things that we're about to read are more things that we're supposed to be adding to our disciplines. But instead of us adding to our disciplines, these things should actually be coming from a heart that is captivated and surrendered to Jesus Christ. So let's read with that in mind in Isaiah chapter 58. Let's start in verse 1. Isaiah says this, Cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments, and they delight to draw near to God. So stop here. Here, Isaiah is speaking speaking on behalf of God here, and he's basically saying to the people, listen, you're drawing near to me, you're doing the things that I commanded you to do, and you're wanting to uh, consider yourselves as people who truly have their hearts captivated by me, but really you don't, because you're still asking these questions, and the the conversation is about to change a little bit, and there's going to be these why questions. And these why questions are things that God is acknowledging that the people of Israel were asking because they're sitting here going, wait, I, I did the stuff. Like, I did all the stuff you told me to do. It's almost like I followed the formula. I followed the steps. I thought I did everything you wanted, and yet still I'm not seeing happen what I thought should happen. Has that ever happened to you before? where maybe you were following God and you started wondering why, because you thought you'd followed all the steps, the things that you read in the Bible, the things you heard someone else talk about, maybe the things you heard taught from Scripture, and you did the things that you thought God was commanding and the things that God was doing, but you're very confused because your outcome isn't what you quite hoped that it would be. Well, God, I'm doing all the stuff. Don't you see all the stuff I'm doing? I did it all, everything you commanded. And it's God showing us that it's not just about compliance, it's about the heart. So he uh, shifts the conversation to acknowledge the questions that the people are asking, much like the questions you and I ask. Here's how this starts in verse 3. Why have we fasted and you see it not? We've been fasting. Like, you're not acknowledging that we're depriving ourselves? 
Because we've been fasting? Uh, Why don't you see it? We're fasting, Lord. Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Which sounds like something a humble person would say. Why don't you see me being humble? And here's what the Lord says, behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure. So even though you're saying, God, don't you see our fasting? Don't you see our religiosity? Don't you see our commitments? Don't you see our discipline? Don't you see our morality? Don't you see the things that we've said yes to and the things that we've done that you've commanded? This is what the people of Israel are wondering. And God calls them out. He calls them out at the heart level. He said, the reason you guys are fasting is because you're actually seeking your own pleasure. That's where your heart really is. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? So the Lord likens their fast to a reed bowing or, or bending. What would cause a reed to bow or to bend? The wind, right? If the wind blows strong enough, you're going to see that reed bow over and, and bow down. And he's likening what they're doing to the wind blowing and the reed responding to the effects of the wind. So in other words, when stuff happens in your life that's beyond your control, and you feel like God is calling you or commanding you to do something, oh, it's easy to just bend because the wind blew. The circumstance caused you to bow. It caused you to want things to be different. And so therefore, you're just going to humble yourself and you're just going to do whatever you got to do. I'm just going to pray however long I need to pray. I'm going to fast. I'm going to do all these things to get this outcome. And I want to see God move and I want to show him how devoted I am to him. But the only reason I'm doing it is because I really ultimately want what I want. Not because I want to know God more, not because he has my heart, but rather I want God to do for me what I know only God can do, but really I'm just thinking about myself. I'm not thinking about others. I'm not thinking about him. I'm just thinking about what can I get out of this deal? And if God wants me to do A, B, and C, oh, I can do those things. I'll discipline myself. I'll fast. I'll, I'll read scripture. I'll, I'll come to the prayer meetings. I'll pray. I'll give in the offering. I'll serve. I'll, I'll give of my time. But the heart behind all of it, what's motivating it is this idea of me just getting from God what I want from God. And God is calling the people of Israel out saying, this is not acceptable. Verse 8, I mean verse 6, is not this the fast that I choose? So God's about to show them what real fasting is that God was calling them to. To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail." Here, God is trying to help them see what he's actually after, what he's looking for. He said the type of of results that a true fast are going to produce are the types of results that actually lead you into action beyond just thinking about yourself. Because if you fast, he's saying, and you you guys haven't changed, You're, you're fasting and you're doing all the right things that I commanded you to do, just like a reed would respond to the wind blowing, But you're still arguing over foolish things. You're still doing wicked things, saying wicked things. You're making life more difficult for other people. You're actually rising up your hand in wickedness to strike like a a wicked fist would strike someone else. So in other words, 
You have not changed. You have not produced the type of fruit of someone whose heart is truly surrendered. And so God knows it's not going to be long before you end right back up in this same exact situation. You just want me to relent because of what I've done. Uh, because of, and you think that because you follow the formula that everything's just going to change. But really, God's not interested in changing the circumstance as much as he's interested in changing you. Amen. And I think a lot of us, when it comes to this idea of repentance, when it comes to this idea of having this godly sorrow, this grieving over our sin, and then seeing things in the world that God has called us to, it reminds me of when Christ said that a tree is going to be known by its fruit. Either make the tree good and the fruit's going to be good, or make the tree bad and the fruit is going to be bad. So a tree is going to be known by its fruit, not just by the things that we can accomplish in our flesh, not just by the things that we can somehow discipline ourselves to do, because good work should come from our heart. Obedience to God should produce good works as fruit. And it's us trusting in Him and Him having our heart, true obedience. And there's a difference between true obedience and compliance. Because you can get your kids to comply with doing chores around the house because they're afraid of losing privileges or getting in trouble, right? But it doesn't mean their heart's in it. It doesn't mean they're overjoyed to help you and contribute to the family. It just means that they don't want to have their privileges taken away or they don't want to get grounded or whatever the case may be, or they want their allowance or however it works in your home. But they have this idea that as long as I comply, everything will be good, but it doesn't mean the heart's there. Sometimes the heart is there, and you can see when their hearts are there, but, you know, oftentimes we are the same way towards God. We think, well, God, I did all the stuff that, you know, your word said. I did all the stuff that you asked me to do. Where's mine? And so we have this idea that it's about us, and we become very us-focused, and we have a wrong view of spiritual disciplines. We have a wrong view of why it is that we fast. We have a wrong idea of why it is we may pray or why we may get into the scriptures a lot of times people think that Christianity is just another book in the self-help section at Barnes & Noble. And Christianity helps me to become a better person. And so we have this idea that we're trying to work on us. And we're just trying to become better versions of ourselves. And that's how a lot of people view Christianity and they miss the whole point. You see, God's not interested in just you becoming a better version of you. He's actually wanting to show himself mightily through you so that he can be glorified and so that men and women can be discipled, coming to know Christ as their Lord and Savior and be rescued from an eternity separated from him. You see, that's what God's actually after, and he uses men and women like you and like me, empowering up us with his gifts to be able to do what he's called us to do. He's not reliant on your ability. God's not going, oh, yay, I got that one on the team, so now I can do stuff I've always wanted to do because I've got a superstar. We need to remember it's not us, but rather it's greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Every time that uh, before I would come out to preach my first couple years here at Word of Grace, there was a man who has since gone on to be with the Lord who would always find me, and he always attended first service. His name was Al. He sat right over there, and Al would always come and find me before service, and he would pray with me, and then he would stay afterwards, after first service was done, and come find me again and pray with me before second service, and Al prayed the same thing every single Sunday for two years straight, and I still pray this before I go out and preach. And I'll never forget the way that Al prayed. He would grab my hand and he would say, Father, he says, fill Derek with your words and let your words be heard by your people. He would pray that every Sunday. And I pray that because I'm asking the Holy Spirit to fill me with his words and for the words of the Lord to be heard by his people, not Derek's words. Amen? Because Derek's just okay at best, probably not even okay in some eyes, and that's fine. We can still be friends. It's not about how you view me, and it's not about me having to be uber creative and come up with all of these flashy, catchy things. No, that's not what we're trying to accomplish here. It's God, you use me to speak your words, let your words be heard by your people. So what happens when we depend on the Holy Spirit is that it takes away the excuses. Because a lot of people... When it comes to moving beyond 
This idea of personal development in Christianity, this idea of personal growth, this idea of becoming a better version of me, the thing that trips people up when it comes to actually serving others and doing the types of things that God spoke through Isaiah, like doing things for the poor and the needy and actually reaching out to people and showing them the love and truth of God, is that we'll make these excuses. Well, you know, that's just not my gift. You know, I can't find one single scripture, and I've read the whole Bible. I can't find one single scripture where God commanded us to do something, and someone said, you know what, Jesus, that's not my gift. Oh, I forgot about that. My bad. My bad. Sorry. That's cool. Or, let me pray about it. I never saw one person in scripture say, you know what, I know you're asking me to do that. Let me go pray about that. No, I don't see anybody doing that. I see the Lord giving us commands and the Lord showing us and telling us very clearly what we're to be about. And these things are not just things that we're supposed to pursue and do as another thing to add to our already long list of things we're trying to accomplish to make ourselves better. These things should be flowing out of us because of our love for God. These things should be coming out of us. Like these are things that's not like, like I want to do something for God. And that's the whole point of this prophecy in Isaiah was that God was saying, you guys just went through and checked the boxes. You guys just went through the laundry list to ease your conscience. You guys just tried to do this blanketed thing to make everything better and it didn't work. And you're scratching your heads going, well, why did we fast? Why didn't you see our fast, God? Why don't you see how humble we are? We're the best at it. And we miss the point. We miss the mark because it wasn't the act that God was after. It was our heart. The same thing in Joel chapter 2 where he said, rend your heart, not your garments only. Rend your heart. You see, he's after your heart. In Ezekiel, we see the prophet Ezekiel said he's going to take out the stony heart and put in a soft heart of flesh. There should be a change. In other words, when I am obedient to Christ, when he truly has my heart, good work should come out of me, not just one more thing I'm trying harder to get better at. Because if I love God, I'm growing in that love for God, and it's coming from my heart. To simply comply is not pleasing to God. To just be a good moral person, doing good moral things that could even be done in the name of Christ. That's not what God's after. He's not after someone to just become a robot. God is after your heart. Amen, church? We often measure obedience to God by our church attendance, by our giving, by our moral behavior. And Isaiah here explains that true obedience results in things like caring for the poor, the oppressed, and the hungry. And I found this great quote when I was preparing this message earlier, and I found this quote from Dr. John Oswald, and if you have an NIV study Bible, uh, he was one of the contributors to that, and that's actually where this comes from, is from that study Bible. It's a great quote by Dr. Oswald. He says this, if they want to deprive themselves Let them do it for the sake of the oppressed, the needy, and the helpless, not for the sake of their own religiosity. God's nature is to give himself away to those who can never repay him. There is no clearer evidence of the presence of God in a person's life than a replication of that same behavior. It's this idea of if we want to fast as we're in this season of Lent, and maybe some of you are participating by fasting something during this stretch of these 40 days, remembering when Christ fasted and was tempted by Satan in the wilderness before he eventually was beaten and then crucified and buried and rose again for your salvation and my salvation. As we think about that 40-day stretch, and perhaps some of you are participating in that I don't want us just going through the motions of fasting or giving up something for Lent because we want to improve our lives and this is the way to enhance us. Because if we're doing that, we're doing it with the wrong motive. You see, actually when we're fasting and depriving ourselves, just like Dr. Oswald said, if we want to deprive ourselves, let's do it for the sake of the oppressed, for the needy, not just for our own religious reasons. God's nature is to give himself away. And if I am fasting, I mean, (laughs) I'm not looking for something from someone because God gives himself away to people who could never repay him. 
So wouldn't it be that an evidence of God's presence in your life and in my life would be that we would emulate that behavior? Not because we're supposed to. You see, here's the fine line. Here's the fine line here. This is so hard. This is a tightrope that we walk as people because we'll look at that and go, oh, I need to start uh, feeding some hungry people and giving to the needy. That's, that's, I, I need to add that to my list. No, no, no. That's not the heart here. The heart here is that because of the love that I have for God, there's an overflow in me that now I'm caring for other people, not because I'm supposed to, but because I want to and because I get to, because my heart's been transformed. It's easy for us to be selfish. Anyone can be self-focused. I mean, heck, you don't even have to be a Christian to figure that one out. If you want to be selfish, that's not a hard path to go down. That is a wide path. And anybody can find the path of selfishness, but a true denial of oneself. When we're intentionally inconveniencing ourselves for the sake of another who could never repay us, and, and, and it's not so that we can be promoted or be given accolades or be given attention, it's surely doing it as unto Christ, and we find our reward in serving and loving Christ and showing other people Christ, that is true humility, and that is true service to God. That's why at Word of Grace we say love God, love people, and serve the world. And when we say this statement, it is a reciprocal statement. It never truly ends. It's like this is the song that never ends as it goes on and on, my friend. And it just keeps going over and over and over again because we love God. And when our hearts are stirred, when our affections are stirred to love God, what happens when we love God? Well, we began to have our desires influenced by that love, and we begin to love things God loves. We begin to hate things God hates. And what does God love? He loves people, for God so loved the world that it did what? Caused him to give his only begotten son. So as I love God, I'm loving what God loves, and God loves people. And as I love him with that God kind of love, and I love people with that love that I've received from God. I freely receive, so I freely give. When I love people, what does it make me want to do because I love them? It makes me want to serve. Now, there's plenty of scriptures that talk about serving one another in the body of Christ, and there is definitely a, a, a strong message and way we as brothers and sisters in Christ, those who have received Christ, those who would call themselves disciples, Christian, those people, there is a way that we are to serve one another, and we're to interact with each other differently than we interact with the world, but we still are called to serve those outside of the family of God as well with what? What do we have to offer them? What could we ever give someone who's outside of the family of God? Well, we have the love of God. So we serve them with what? We serve them by showing them the love of God, being the hands and feet of Jesus, that in hopes that by our love, by some, some planting, some watering, and God opening the eyes and giving the increase and bringing them unto salvation as the Spirit of God draws them to himself, Maybe it's a little investment here of love, a little investment there of love, and showing compassion to men and women who may not yet have experienced the wonderful grace of Jesus Christ. And when we do that, we're serving them with the love of God. So what happens? Those people experience the love of God through the way that we serve them, the way we treat them, the way that we care for them. And then guess what is stirred in their hearts? A love for God. And then they experience the love of God. And what do they do? They begin to love people. And what do they begin to do when they grow in their love for God and people? It makes them want to serve. And what are they serving other people with? The love of God. You see, it just keeps going on and on and on and on over and over. And none of us get to the apex or the pinnacle to where we stop growing in loving God, loving people, and serving the world. This is what we're called to do. So may our fasting, may our spiritual disciplines, may our pursuit of God, may our disciplines in reading the scripture, in our giving, and in our loving other people be focused on showing others the love of God, not just on improving myself. Because we're not just another book in the self-help section. Amen? There's something that should change in us that causes us to look outside of ourselves. And if we're only looking at ourselves and we're so narcissistic and we're wrapped up in ourselves, have we really repented and truly experienced the love of God? Because is it all about me? 
all about me being better and me growing and me. Yeah, there's an element, listen, of us wanting to grow and pursue personally, and, but that shouldn't be our drive. It shouldn't be our focus because Isaiah said that the type of fruit that comes out of good spiritual discipline is actually going to be a concern and a care for other people. Let's go over to James chapter 2. You can flip over there with me. James chapter 2. Some of you Bible scholars are going to know where I'm going. James chapter 2 and verse 14. We're going to read through verse 26. James writes this, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without having given them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, well, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. Here, James, he's writing and saying the exact same thing and addressing this issue that you and I do when it comes to those gifts. Oh, yeah, it's just not my gift. It's not my calling. No, 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 no. He's, y- y- you're good at faith. I'm good at works. You know, whatever the case may be, you, you do this. No. Listen, the Holy Spirit is going to enable you and empower you to do the things that are beyond you. If it was something that was within your ability or within your scope or within your comfort or your strength, God wouldn't need to give you his spirit. He could just go, oh, good luck out there. Of course it's going to stretch you. May we never forget someone somewhere at some time had to stretch themselves and inconvenience themselves to show the love of God and share the gospel with you. Someone had to do that. Otherwise, you would not have known Christ. Someone at some point had to share the truth of the gospel from the scriptures with you. Someone at some point had to serve you with the love of God. So that means someone somewhere intentionally inconvenienced themselves to be able to share the hope of Jesus Christ with you. And God never said, okay, and now it's up to you to figure out the rest. No, it's time for us to in turn, stretch ourselves, be willing to get uncomfortable, to follow the call of God that he's put on the inside of us, to to help us to see what he's doing on the inside of us, and to say yes to what he's asking us to do. And there are so many things that God puts in front of us every single day, simple, simple opportunities, that when we get so focused on ourselves, we miss. But when our spiritual disciplines are for the sake of serving other people, our antenna's up a little higher. We can be a little bit more sensitive to the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit because we're not just seeking the leading of the Spirit for ourselves. We're actually seeking the leading of the Spirit to be able to serve others. When you pray, I would encourage you to do this. Save your personal stuff for last. When you pray, start off by praising God and thanking Him for who He is and what He's done. And then once your heart is at a place of gratitude and trust and reminding yourself of the faithfulness of God, and you are going to actually petition Him, lift up things to Him, asking Him to move or to do, a, do something in, in a situation, I would encourage you to begin to pray for other people first rather than start off just praying for yourself. Because how many times do we go to God? Oh, God, I need you to do this. Oh, God, I need, I need, I need. Oh, God, I I want you to do this for me, for me. And it becomes very self-focused. I would encourage you, it would be a good practice to temper your heart, to train your heart, to begin to think about other people and allow the Lord to work in you a greater degree of compassion for other people. Pray for others' needs ahead of your own. And then also look for opportunities to serve. Here James said that it's not just about you saying, oh, well, I have this gift and you have that gift. No, 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 no. He said, I'm going to show you actually my faith by the way that I live. Let's keep reading verse 19. You believe that God is one, you do well, but even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? 
Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works, not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. He's saying, listen, it's not just about you believing and sitting at home full of all of your belief. It's not just about you coming once a week and hearing a great message and being stirred and feeling like you're smarter or somehow you're blessed or benefit from the hearing and the preaching of the word. No, it should translate into something. If you're a person of faith, good work should follow. Not because you're trying to make it work, but because your heart has been captivated, because the two can't be separated, because it's going to be part of this tree being known by its fruit. If I'm really repenting, if I'm really fasting, if I'm really pursuing, if I'm really pursuing the heart of God through Scripture, if I'm really doing these things, it this stuff should flow out of me. It's not something I try to be really, really hard and maybe I can make it happen. No, no, no. It's not like that orange tree going, I hope I can, I hope, I hope I can be an orange tree. Oh, I want to make oranges so much. Nope. If the ground is healthy, if everything is where it's supposed to be, if the right nutrients, if the right water, it's going to produce the fruit naturally. That's just the evidence of the health and what's happening in the ground and the things surrounding the tree and what's happening on the inside. The fruit is just the result. It's this idea of us surrendering to how God has created us and what he's called us to do in us surrendering and trusting and saying, not my will, but your will be done. You see, repentance and true heart change are demonstrated by a love for one another. It's me repenting, not just because I I'm saying, God, I'm sorry, and God's like, but your heart's not in it. Your heart hasn't been there. I, I used to do this when I was a kid. I remember when I would go to bed, my mom would always do this thing like, all right, say your prayers, and mom would have us like a scripture or two that we were learning, and to, you know, uh, recite your scriptures that you're memorizing, and, and say your prayers, and we would always kind of go through the same rhythm every night, and I remember praying this way as a kid. I, I would pray, and I would say, God, Forgive me for my sins and forgive me for all the sins that I don't even know I committed. Like, you know, I would pray like, like God, like I wanted to make sure like I had covered everything, all of my bases, like even the stuff that I did wrong that I'm like, I didn't even know it was wrong, Lord, forgive me for that too. Um, and I just wanted to make sure I covered everything. But was that real heart change? Was that real repentance? No. And maybe you pray the same way. Here's a better way to pray if perhaps you pray that way, and you're praying that way out of fear just to get something from God. Instead, pray this. Say, God, would you help me to see the things that maybe I didn't realize broke your heart or may have offended a brother or sister in Christ? Because God, I want to have a godly sorrow over those things, and I want to work repentance, not just this blanket of, God, forgive me for all the stuff I've done, and yeah, the stuff I didn't even know about too. That's about like you're when you're a little kid telling your brother or sister you're sorry for doing something and you're just trying to say I'm sorry to get out of trouble or hope you don't have to hug at the end, you know? I'm sorry, you know. <laughs> God, forgive me for all my sin. No, 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 that's not how this works. There's a godly sorrow that works repentance, but the fruit of that should be life change. The fruit of that should be a turning away. Just like the fruit of fasting should not just be something that we hope to grow and gain ourselves, and now we're at this new spiritual level of elation. No, no, no. It's not just about me somehow getting closer in my heart or in my mind to God. It should actually be something where I'm saying, God, do something in me to where I'm more aware of the needs of other people so I can be a brighter light to shine for your kingdom. Help my heart be stirred with compassion for the things that break your heart. Help me to see the needs around me so that I can share the truth of the gospel with other people. 
Help me to see, God, my, my selfishness through this fast as I'm, as I'm broken of myself so that I can repent and I can actually be more aware and sensitive to the opportunities that the Holy Spirit leads and guides me in that you want me to be aware of so that I can be a messenger of truth so that I can be someone who's filled with the Holy Spirit, who you may use in an instant to share something with someone, to encourage them, or maybe perhaps to be able to serve someone in a way that would bring you honor and glory. Lord, I want to be available. I want to be in tune with the things that are on your heart for other people, not just, not just for me, not just for me. No, it's God. Use me for your glory, for your kingdom. So what has your love for God motivated you to do for other people lately? Because if, it's, if our love for God hasn't motivated us to do a whole lot for other people lately, what, what are we missing? What, what are we missing in this? Are we just going through the motions of doing spiritual disciplines for the sake of our own enhancement? And we think that that's the end goal, is just for us to become better versions of ourselves? Or are we doing it to bring honor and glory to God and actually serving other people? This question is one that I want you to think about, and don't readily answer it, because that's the, you know, the Sunday school, raise your hand, you know, Jesus in the Bible is the answer for everything. And I, I want you to think about it. And maybe this question will actually, in a healthy way, haunt you a little bit and cause you to evaluate things in your own life and help us evaluate as a church. If Word of Grace were to close its doors this next week, and this was the last service that we ever had, who in our community, who in this area would notice and who would be impacted? Who would be heartbroken and what would they be heartbroken over? What would they actually miss the most about the fact that this local assembly of believers could not gather together and could not uh, uh, continue to serve in the capacity that we are now, what, what would be the thing they would miss the most? And as we ask those questions, it should cause us to evaluate our own hearts, to say, Lord, what are we doing for your kingdom? How are we loving people? And maybe there are some good things that you could answer, that you could say, yeah, people would miss this and this. That's great. Don't become prideful in those things. Continue to ask God, how can we be that city set on a hill, that, that light that's shining in the darkness, that place that's just being that beacon of hope, waving the banner of Jesus Christ as the hope for all mankind. Amen, church? It's who we're called to be. Have you felt compassion for injustice around the world? Have you seen a need and stepped up to allow the love of God that's been shown to you to be shown to others in an intentional way. Because if we cannot serve others with God's love, is God's love active in our lives? According to Isaiah, a truly repentant heart, a truly disciplined heart that is, has positioned itself in a way of fasting and is actually a heart that cannot help but to change the way that they care about people. With all of our spiritual disciplines of fasting during the season of Lent, are our spiritual habits and our, our sacrifices turning our hearts towards others' needs and hurts? And here's your bottom line this morning. True heart change produces action that reflects God's nature to the world. This is the thing that I want you to take away here this morning is that real, real authentic heart change is going to produce something in us. It's going to produce action, action that's going to reflect the heart of God. So that means that as I pursue Him, as I seek Him in the Scriptures, I'm, I'm actually learning His heart. I'm learning what pleases Him. I'm learning what breaks His heart. I'm learning the things that that, that actually cause God's hand to move and cause God to intervene in certain situations, are, are those the things that are motivating me as well? Have I repented over my selfishness? Have I repented over my sin and my pride and my desire to try to elevate my own view of myself as being a spiritual, moral person? Sometimes we get so caught up in that that we miss what really matters. 
And we miss the simple things that God's actually calling us to that don't really take any special abilities, that don't take any special talents, that don't take any special personality types, that don't take any spiritual gifts assessments or quizzes or Myers-Briggs or anything like that. Just people loving Jesus and Jesus working in people's hearts and it causes change in them with the way that they see the needs around them. The way that they view their mission, the way they view their purpose. You and I live in a very self-centered society and this is hard for us because we're raised in an individualistic society that only thinks about ourselves. And for us to be challenged with a word like this today should cause us to evaluate, should cause us to actually ask ourselves some hard questions. And if God's revealing some stuff to you, what do I do, pastor? You repent. You allow it to cause godly sorrow in you because godly sorrow works repentance. And what is repentance? It's a turning away. It's a change. It's a committing to leave certain things behind and a committing to picking up those new things for the glory and for the honor of God, for the furthering of the gospel, for the furthering of the kingdom. Jesus didn't just give the great commission to select disciples before he ascended into heaven. He gave that to all of us who would be called his disciples, to go into all the world to make disciples. We believe that a disciple is someone who is deeply devoted, who is growing in loving God, loving people, serving the world. Someone who is, has their affections and their heart set on God, who has their heart and their affections set on eternal things. That's why we're a church that's willing to say yes to greater things. And if our hearts really belong to Jesus, it should produce change in us. It should produce action that reflects God's character, God's nature. And so we can't do this on our own, right? So why don't we take a minute and why don't we just pray and ask God to help us with this. God, thank you so much for this time that we've had together in your word. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness on display and at work in every one of our lives and in our church family. God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit who is distributing gifts to each one to accomplish your purposes here in the earth, in our lives, and in the lives of people around us. Help us to see the error of our ways when we have uh, trusted in ourselves or when we've just made everything about us, when perhaps, Lord, you're revealing to our hearts today, Lord, our own selfishness that needs repenting of. So we confess it openly here before you today, God. We confess our selfishness. We confess, Lord, our tendencies to only think about ourselves and to miss, Lord, your heart for other people. Help our eyes to be open to see that clearly. Also, we pray that you would soften our hearts, fill us with your Holy Spirit to be sensitive, to be able to discern, God, when you're providing opportunities or when you're drawing us to something. And you're wanting us to say yes to something greater for your kingdom, something much greater than ourselves, something much greater than our own ambition, something greater than our own self-improvement. Lord, may our heart beat for what your heart beats for. May we love the things you love. May we pursue the things that bring you glory and honor. And may we leave behind everything that doesn't reflect or resemble your nature, your character as we die to ourselves, as we crucify our flesh, as we walk in the Spirit and are led by the Spirit. Holy Spirit, work in every heart here, every heart that's listening to this message today, and do in us what brings you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.